Welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. Today's episode is a conversation I recently had with Katherine Schmidt, who is a science communication specialist at Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park. I think that her passion and deep, deep interest in science communication comes through in every part of our conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Catherine, welcome to the Main Science Podcast. You are, I think, our first, what I would call, official or formal science communicator, which is ironic given that that's one of the gists of this whole podcast. So I thought you could talk a little bit about your background in science, um, which I know is the, the grand environmental science area that a lot of undergraduates did in the 90s when that finally came about as an opportunity. Um, I remember when I started in college, that was not a thing. And then by the time I ended college, it was a thing. So um, if you could kind of talk a little bit about your, your background, and then we'll get into the communication part. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and it's certainly about time you had a science communicator. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast. Um, and I do have a background in environmental science. So it's interesting you sort of mentioned that 90s because I was interested in, you know, environmental stuff in high school and there wasn't a lot going on. We had an environmental club with, I think, about five or six people in it in high school. And all I remember us doing was talking about how we needed more recycling bins. And that was pretty much the limit of what we could do as as students. And so it's been, it's really nice to see how that has changed and how students have uh, found their voice and are using it. And one of the things that I like about my job now is getting to work with some of those young professionals. Um, So I was starting from scratch. I volunteered at a nature center. I worked at an environmental camp for high school, early high school students, uh, many of whom, this was in Northern New Jersey. And so many of these students had never been camping, never really been to the woods. And we did a lot of waste management and wastewater management issues, as well as some nature activities. Um, And I did that for a few years. And then environmental science was an option for a major, uh, which is what I selected. And And there was a big split at that time as those programs were emerging between environmental science and environmental studies. Um, And I chose, um, based on some advice, to go the science route. So it was chemistry, organic chemistry, calculus, biology, um, very kind of a difficult track, I would say. It's interesting, right? I remember that the controversy or the, you know, is it sciences? Is it studies? And both of them are really broad in very different areas, but, but the focus is, you know, like you said, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of biology, or a little bit of psychology and a little bit of sociology. Like there's, you have to, it's almost a jack of all trades type of thing for both of those fields. I remember being, I don't know, it was was just past when I was done with school. So I remember thinking, oh man, I wish I'd known about that. That would have, you know, I wish that had happened earlier. Well, you know, I don't regret anything, but in retrospect, I should have just majored in biology. That would have been sort of a better track. A lot of fellow students that couldn't, that couldn't handle the organic chemistry and the calculus, they ended up sort of moving over to wildlife and sort of natural resource management. Um, So that was at University of Massachusetts Amherst, which was a great, a great experience. Um, And I did take, so I was still interested in writing, even as an undergrad, and I took some creative writing courses when I could fit them in. Uh, And I wrote my first published piece was for the college newspaper. I had an editorial about cloning, um, also a very 90s issue, um, revealing my Generation X. um, (laughs) Right there with you. (laughs) Um, And I also had an article. So I spent a semester out on the West Coast and there was an environmental organization out there, nonprofit that I volunteered for. And they had a little eco news monthly newspaper. And I wrote for them a story about Glen Canyon Dam. And then I had some friends who started a magazine in Boston called What's Up Magazine. And this was modeled after Spare Change, which is a magazine in London that people without homes sell it on the street. And it's a way to sort of um, support them and provide them 
a modest means of living. And so modeled after that was this uh, magazine in Boston, print magazine. And I wrote some really lofty articles about pop- human population increases. I wrote an article about climate change, including a hand-drawn graphic of the greenhouse effect, uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, uh, the World Trade Organization, some of the sort of really big global environmental issues. I had not yet learned the lesson that you should sort of stay local and emphasize the local. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for being in your 20s and and having (laughs) grand scope and grand ideas. Yes. And then I I had worked at an environmental consultant. So the environmental science program that I was in very much was tracking us to enter sort of the private sector and the field of sort of consulting or maybe working for like a state agency. And I didn't uh, necessarily want to do that, but that that was just where I ended up, um, given sort of personal situation and where I was living. Um, so I did wetlands consulting, wetland delineation, as well as site assessments. So assessing properties for pollution potential, which involved a lot of research and ended up being a really good experience in how to investigate pollution and how to investigate a place and learn its history. I also had a couple of field experiences sort of in beaches and salt marshes. And um, I did piping plover stuff. I did salt marsh sea level rise assessments um, at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole. That was all before consulting. And then I did consulting for a few years, but I still kind of wanted to write and I wasn't writing that much. And so I was kind of, and I was thinking about going back to school, to graduate school, Um, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I kind of wanted like one more work experience to kind of help me figure it out. So I was applying for like fellowships and and other sort of opportunities, including in Maryland, which turned into a job opportunity with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science doing science writing. Um, So so I was sort of offered this opportunity that I couldn't refuse. And I moved to Maryland to the eastern shore uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. Very, very different landscape than than I had ever sort of been in before. It was actually very sort of shocking at first to be in such a flat, um, such a flat area w- without sort of access to the woods it was very sort of isolating. Um, but that was great. I got to work on publications about the Chesapeake Bay and marine pollution. So the Pew Oceans Commission had just sort of started and they were issuing a bunch of reports and and this turned into sort of the, what became the National Ocean Policy, but there was a lot of action among nonprofits to kind of push the government towards that. And so there was a series of reports from the Pew Oceans Commission, and I helped with the one on marine pollution. Um, so that's pretty cool, actually. You actually got to narrow down and because of that, have an influence larger because of the way that you said it, it, it fell into a National Ocean Pollution Program. So, you know, you said a few minutes ago, you didn't know to start small and local. And right. it sounds like here you had the opportunity to start small and local, but then also as a result, have an influence much larger, which is really interesting, actually. Um, people forget that that's how that happens often. Yeah. And how these, why these reports are issued, you know, and, and at that time, you know, a new report, it was a lot of, you know, synthesis of the science on marine pollution with recommendations for policy. And I just sort of learned about that world and and also got to work with a lot of different scientists and sort of synthesizing information and a lot of review by scientists. And and that's something that I've sort of continued throughout my career of this idea of being able to work with teams of three, five, 50, 100 scientists and having to write something that represents sort of their consensus. And then, so then I, you know, I could have, so then it was like, okay, you're going to go back to school. And I was still like, do I go for writing or do I go for science? And I looked at various programs and both, I even considered law. Um, After doing consulting, I really, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I didn't want to spend that much time in school because I wouldn't be outside. And so I ended up coming to the University of Maine. So I had tried to get jobs in Maine previously, but I didn't, couldn't get in. You know, now I know how hard it is to get jobs here. Um, So school was my ticket in, and I went to the University of Maine in the ecology and environmental science program. So I stayed in that track, but I was at the Mitchell Center for Environmental and Watershed Research, which was its name at that time. Now it's the 
George J. Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions. Um, but at that time, so still kind of, this is early 2000s, so still kind of that, it's still in that 90s era of environmental science, I would say. Um, and they did a lot of watershed research. So lakes, streams, a lot of monitoring acid rain and air quality, how, as it's reflected by water quality. So I got to do a lot of field work all over the state of Maine. I mean, within a month of moving here, I was up in St. Francis and up in Aroostook County meeting with like small drinking water suppliers. Um, a couple, within two months, I was in a helicopter sampling high elevation lakes across Western Maine mountains. I'm just curious, when did you know that writing was gonna be a big, huge focus or something that you wanted and, and figuring out how to merge that with your science interest? <laughs> So figuring out how to merge it was the hard part. I mean, writing was, I was into that at the same time, you know? So, I mean, I just wrote a lot. Like I journal, you know, I just wrote a lot as a teenager. And I was so sort of that, you know, adolescence and coming of age. And I was, I just read a lot and I was really into the beats um, and sort of obsessed with them and, and just, writing was sort of my outlet, I guess. And, and merging them was always the challenge. So I was always sort of torn and I would fit in writing classes, you know, winter session, or when I could finally, when I finally had room in my schedule for an elective that I could take, I would try to fit it in. And, you know, I did okay. Like I always got good grades on my papers and stuff. I still remember environmental policy class, probably 200, 250 people in this class. And college and my paper, you know, the professor would put their papers out on the desk at the front of the lecture hall and you would go alphabetically and you would go get your paper to get your grade. And mine wasn't there. So I had to go up to him and I was like, where's my paper? And he was like, and he like opened his briefcase and he was like, I wanted to meet you or whatever, as he like handed me my paper with like the A plus plus, you know, um, you know, and it's like when I read it now, it's like slightly embarrassing. But at the time, you know, I was setting a scene. I was using very I was mimicking what I was reading in sort of journalism and environmental literature at the time. And it was always nonfiction that drew you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. All right. Maybe maybe that's not the right way. to. You always wanted to write nonfiction is what I'm at. Like, was that. This is my ignorance. Well, Most people, when I think yeah. of writing, they want to do fiction, right? Or creative writing yeah, in so a fiction po- realm. Right. So poetry was probably more, you know, I think poetry is a little bit because you don't have anything to write about. So nonfiction is hard when you're younger because you just like, what are you going to, you just don't have enough experience or education to sort of have ideas of what to write about. But poetry is a lot easier because it's sort of imagery and it just sort of, I think it when you're younger, it's just sort of, it's emotional. I don't know. So I was probably trying to write poems and little essays and yeah, you know, a lot of like tortured young, you know, lost loves and things like sure, that. Sure. We've all done that in different ways. So yeah. Um, all right, so you- but yeah, it was always sort of non, it was, yeah, I never wanted to be a novelist or something. I just don't, it's like my brain is just not wired for that. Well, that's uh, so interesting. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit you have written three books, which strikes me as just as hard as being a novelist. And please oh, correct me if easier. I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. it's not any easier. It's, it's okay. not easier in, in any way. Um, I mean, sometimes it feels harder, right? Because fiction, you just make stuff up <laughs> and when nonfiction to make it interesting, right. To make it interesting, but they're, they're both equally difficult in their own ways. Um, and it really wasn't till graduate school that I sort of got serious. So I had some clips, you know, I mean, I had, and I had good advice. So I had some mentors who just gave me good advice, which was just write. Like, if you want to do it, don't pay, you know, I ended up going to school for science because I'd get paid for it. Whereas if I went to school for writing, I'd have to pay. So it was a really a financial decision of what was better for me. And so I went to graduate school for science because I got paid and that was my job. And because I had gotten the advice, like, just write, just find a way to write. And so I did write for free. I wrote when I was a consultant, I wrote for the Association of Massachusetts Wetland Scientists, you know, which is a statewide group. And they had a little newsletter and the editor was nice and let me write stuff. And I wrote about stone walls and there was a lot of sort of, you know, you'd encounter them a lot 
marking out subdivisions in the woods of Western Massachusetts. And, and I wrote about policy decisions about wetlands and things like that. So, so I had rec, you know, good experience and good advice. So I had a little bit of clips. Um, it's very important that you start publishing to get your name on things. Um, this was all, this is all like pre-internet too, let's remember. So this is all print only. So you couldn't just like, it was harder to just self-publish. So I had some clips and then in graduate school, I just looked at, you know, publications and um, there was the Maine Independent Media Association and they had a little paper called the Maine Commons. And so um, I did some actually sort of investigative work early on when I was still a graduate student that I'm still really proud of investigating pollution from Bangor International Airport um, and the former military site, um, pollution that communities around Bangor are still dealing with. I did a story about the closure of Great Northern Paper, and I went up to Millinocket and I interviewed mill workers of when that first initial closure happened. Um, so some pretty big stories for someone who is still pretty green in terms of understanding Maine and the political and historical context here. And then it just sort of evolved from there after grad. So after when I finished graduate school, I was just really lucky enough that a science writer job came open with Maine Sea Grant. I had worked with Sea Grant when I was in Maryland. So I knew about them as an organization. And I knew that they hired, that they, that they there was a job called science writer and that they hired communications people. So I was sort of aware of that. And so I kind of paid attention when I got to Maine and it was really just luck and timing that that position came open. So you said you had tried to get to Maine and get a job in Maine before graduate school. Why, like, what was it about Maine that you wanted to get here? It was the the mountains and the ocean right next to each other. I mean, I, I don't understand why anybody wouldn't want to live in Maine. I was just curious what it was for yeah. you. So, And it was wilder, you know, it's sort of the ultimate wild, um, you know, coming from more um, settled and developed areas. It was sort of. You mentioned Northern New Jersey. Where did you yeah. grow up? Is Northern that where you grew up? Oh, okay. Yep. And that's really different. I mean, it's interesting. New Jersey, right, is, um, is much more open in a lot of places than people realize. But I think Northern New Jersey is packed in and, and you, you are kind of in the shadow of New York city and it's a, it's very, very urban. Even the suburban parts feel very urban to me. All right. So Maine Sea Grant and you were there, I think that's when you and I first crossed paths was in different things with Sea Grant and you were there for quite some time. And then I think from there you ended, you, that's, you were there and then went to Scudic, right? Correct. Yeah. So I was at Sea Grant for 15 years. So I started as a science writer half time. And then the Mitchell Center sort of created a, another half position to, to, so that I could be full time. Um, so that was great, that sort of support. And so I had two job, you know, two half time jobs for um, about four years. And then that was just sort of not very sustainable. And so then I moved to Sea Grant full time and then became communications coordinator. And then the last um, five years or so as director of communications for Sea Grant. And Sea Grant, you know, they um, were founded in the early 1970s and always had communications as a part of their mission. And so that was just a really great opportunity to learn the coast of Maine. You know, the entire we Sea Grant serves the entire state. And I used to say pretty much any coastal issue that's happening, Sea Grant is involved in some way, whether funding research or working with communities on the, on the issue or, or communicating about it. So I learned about a lot of different things and got to write about a lot of different issues and organisms. And did you serve or reach both of those audiences? And by that, I mean, communicate to the public about what the scientists were doing and then also how much was it? I, I don't think you were communicating with the scientists, but but getting understanding all the different facets of, of all the different science that was happening and, and making sure that everybody understood what everybody else was doing. You know, nice and easy, super easy. 
<laughs> I mean, was it, or was it mostly outward facing, I guess is what I'm asking. Right. So mostly outward facing my whole career. It's been outward communicating okay. to non-scientists, but we also had a lot of specialized audiences that included scientific audiences. So like I edited reports that aquaculture, you know, practitioners and researchers would read about the technical details of, of farming different types of seaweed, for example, like that's not that outward facing. So a lot of scientific, like communicating to other scientists, but because they're always multidisciplinary. So the same tenets apply, whether it's the public or scientists from a different discipline, right? The same principles of good communication are going to apply. It just, it just might be that the level, right? I think a lot of my audiences, so one of the big shifts with my job now is I think a lot of the audiences with Sea Grant, they were either sort of very general public, understandable to everyone, some of the ocean literacy kind of writing, like my book, A Coastal Companion, right? Not technical, but a lot of kind of more higher level, like technical writing. And so I'm trying to bring that down even more. Um, because we were writing to specialized audiences. So we might be communicating to like state legislators, right? And so that's a certain education level and a certain very sort of specific audience. I also worked on the Maine's Climate Future Reports while I was with Sea Grant. Um, And so there's been, there have been three of those. And so that was one of the ones I was thinking of when I was talking about working with a hundred different scientists who are all sort of pulling things together. So that's an example of that report was also for scientists but also for legislators. Yeah, it's really interesting. I didn't realize until I got to observe people in graduate school. I was around all these people doing a PhD and I didn't realize they didn't know everything, right? Because you hear PhD and you're like, oh, but they know everything. And I remember, you know, at one point my husband was at a physics colloquium and it wasn't his area of physics. And he said, yeah, I was done five minutes in. I was like, really? You don't know that stuff? And he just looked at me. So I think it's really easy to forget that every field of science has its own jargon and everybody is used to that. And so to translate that into another field of science is actually, it's not trivial. It's actually pretty hard to do. And how do you thread that needle? And um, I would imagine there are some, you know, you have probably forgotten more than most people will ever get to learn about some of the areas of science because you have to learn it. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but you would have to learn it at, at enough of a degree to explain it to someone else, whether they're in science or not. Does that, I mean, it's really, you must always be learning something. I am. I am always. And that's why, that's why I love what I do because I never get to learn. I mean, I would stay in school if I could, you know, and so I get to keep learning about different things. And so it was nice at Seagrant and it's nice at Scudic Institute that there's such a diversity of projects and science going on to write about, but you know, the issue of jargon and even within discipline, scientists not being able to talk to themselves. So that's actually gotten worse. There was a recent study that showed that the jargon has increased and it actually, it hampers science because if, if the scientists can't even talk to each other, you know, then how, how are we going to communicate it elsewhere? And for scientists, the more there was a paper that a study of jargon that showed that the more jargon you use, the less likely your paper is to be cited by other scientists. So if you're using jargon, like you're just, your science just isn't going to get out there and it's not going to get cited as much because I was, I was working on a story recently. This was a freelance story and I, and I'm used to like, you know, I go to the literature, like when I'm researching something, I go to the scientific peer review literature to just find out like who's doing, who's, you know, researching something right now. What's kind of the latest thing. I look for review papers and this was a topic I hadn't really, it was like a deep sea thing that I hadn't written about. And I was having, I was having like a really hard time interpreting these papers. And I was communicating with the, the authors, the scientists, and I was like getting stuff wrong, you know, like really get, they were correcting me. And I was like, why is this so like, am I so far out of school that I'm like rusty and I can't understand these papers anymore. So I felt very, I felt a lot better when I saw that research about how jargon papers have gotten harder to read and the issue of jargon has gotten worse. Do you think that's a, because the higher you get up in science, you have to specialize to such a degree that you then that's 
that's the only person you're talking to, which is really, I get it. I understand how that happens, but is that the reason, do you think? I think that makes sense. I haven't, I haven't thought a lot about why. I think if you look at science as like, that you write science is like this living thing, this living sort of process with a history that's sort of constantly sort of building on itself. And so that, that trajectory towards more jargon and specialized language is sort of this natural, it's one path that science could have taken to just get that way. And it's probably the whole like, you know, machine or ecosystem of science is, is forcing it to go that way by the reward system, right? All of the sort of other motivations that scientists have for publishing. And, and maybe the types of papers that are like review papers or holistic or synthetic papers that are understandable by the general public, right? They're not gonna get the attention or the rewards the way that that more technical papers are. Yeah, that makes right? sense to me. Okay, we can solve the world's problems of science communication <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> um, what exactly do you get to do at Scudic? And, and if you could also actually, uh, I, it stuns me to say this out loud, but it's probably true. Probably everybody who listens to this doesn't know about Scudic Institute the same way um, I do, and certainly not the same way you do. So please feel free to enlighten us. And I'm sure there's more you can tell me as well. Scudic Institute at Acadia National Park is a nonprofit partner of the National Park Service, and we manage one of 18 research learning centers. Um, these are National Park Service facilities that focus on research, science, and education. And so Scudic is one of them, and we're based in Winter Harbor at the former Navy base. Um, so Scudic Point became part of Acadia National Park in 1929, and then shortly after for reasons involving Rockefeller and the Park Loop Road in Acadia and the Ottercliff Navy Station got moved to Scudic Point. But the plan was always that the site would revert back to the National Park Service. And so when the base closed in around 2000 um, and the park sort of had all these facilities of apartments and um, office buildings and recreational halls and sort of it it was a logical thing to, to make it one of these research learning centers in the park service. So there's a network across the country of research learning centers. And so Scudic Institute is a nonprofit that sort of helps and works with the park on science and education. We also have our own team of scientists and our focus areas are marine ecology, forest ecology, and bird ecology. We bring a lot of students and citizen science to Acadia National Park. Um, including the Scudic Education Adventure, which is a multi-day residential program for middle school students. Some of them, again, from Maine and have never seen the ocean before. So it's a pretty significant program. So we also help manage all the research permitting in Acadia. So there's a lot of science in Acadia National Park. Um, about 80 research projects, different research projects a year are going on in the park. And so we help the park to manage those permits and the reporting that comes out of those permits. And so my job is to help communicate about all that research that's going on in Acadia, as well as the research by Scudic Institute scientists and students. So even more diverse. So I think one of the, the best things when I started, so about three years ago now was uh, I was like, I get to write about trees uh, it was very sort of exciting. So I immediately sort of plunged into this six part series on the future forest of Acadia. We have a lot of research about climate change and how it's affecting the forests and running experiments to sort of help the park with decisions they might have to make about managing the future forest. So all of our research at Scudic really focuses on the rapid change that parks and other protected areas are experiencing. And we work with Acadia, but we also work with parks across the country. So uh, we also help manage the Second Century Stewardship Program, which funds early career research fellows who are conducting research in Acadia and also offers science communication and citizen science training for parks across the country. So I've gotten to work with a lot of different parks since I started as well. The Second Century Program also has, has a science communication, citizen science part to it. It does, yes. So how much do you have to 
explain to those early career researchers the value probably not the value of the science communication, but how much do you have to kind of break down their use of jargon to get them to that point where they can communicate <clears throat> because they are right in the, in the crux of jargon land, right? I'm assuming based on what I know about where people are in their early career, that's how they got there was, <laughs> was that, how much do you have to break that down before you can build it back up? Uh, well, first the fellows that we get are pretty, they're pretty, um, they know that communication is a part of the fellowship. And so, and they have to, the application includes a statement about their sort of their interest in science communication. So it's not a surprise. So they're usually pretty good communicators to start with um, and have an interest in motivation. But definitely the first, you know, couple modules in the science communication training are about jargon and, and what's, what's called the curse of knowledge. So this idea that once you learn something, it's really, really hard to unlearn it. And that is, that's what the jargon reflects. And so I spend, and I'm find myself actually over the, you know, multiple times I've, so I designed this science communication training um, for second century stewardship, and I've sort of been adjusting it. And I taught science writing when I was at the University of Maine. So it's sort of built on um, my experience te teaching college students as well as doing seminars and workshops on communication, but I'm focusing more and more on language and the jargon and the messaging. A lot of science communication training kind of jumps right to make a video or sort of tell a story or, you know, they kind of want to jump to the output and the product. And so, and I back everything way up and talk about audience and your purpose in communicating and then the language that we use. That leads me to think, how, how do you step it out or, or space it out? Like how, you have 80 projects you're paying attention to, <laughs> all of them, I assume, fairly different fields, but also different sciences and different intensities. You know, I'm going to, I know there's forestry, I know there's uh, issues with, with climate change and the species that are moving in to Acadia and Scooter, both plant and animal. How do you figure out the steps of, of we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to do it this way and not even the getting rid of the jargon part, like how do you figure those steps out and what to talk about from month to month in your job? Like, how do I decide what to write about? How do you figure out which topic to write about and break it down enough so that you can write about it without it consuming three months of your time so you can go on and do the <laughs> next thing, right? There's a lot there. Well, deadlines help. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Um, so, so deadlines help. And I think in the training, there's a, I have sort of this, we talk about the timing of research. And so when in the life of any research project, there are moments in the life of that project that are opportunities for communicating. So you've got the moment when you get the grant, right? That's an announcement opportunity. And a lot of times in the news, you'll read a story about some big grant happening, and then you never hear another thing about it, right? So there's that opportunity. Hey, we just got all this money. We're going to study this thing and save the world. And then there's the, the field work, right? So there's all this stuff that happens in the middle of going out and having your meetings and scheduling your field work and doing your field work and coming back to the lab and doing the analysis. That's where I like to spend my time is in that middle. But often that's, um, that often is not where we get to see a lot of science. Often, then we only hear it about it when the paper comes out and the study is published. That's a news moment. That's when the press release goes out. That's when you find out what the scientists discovered and how it's gonna change the world. And then you never hear another thing about it, right? So, so between those two points is where science is and that's where science lives. And that's like where science actually happens. And so that's to me is the best time to cover it. So when we think about science in Acadia National Park, what's happening now and who's in the field right now? So right when I'm finished talking to you, I'm gonna head down to Scudic and meet Susan Brawley out in the field um, because she'll be out there at low tide collecting seaweeds. And I'm gonna find out about her latest project in the park. And so that, that lends urgency and sort of helps to structure things. When are science, scientists gonna be doing their science? that's when I'm going to cover it. And so that's a, that's a big part of it. And then, and then I, I also, and I think this comes from my work at Sea Grant, where if something is publicly funded, 
where science is happening on public lands, there's an obligation to communicate the results and the impact of that research. And so that becomes a priority then if there are results or something with implications for parks is happening, then that's going to get priority in terms of coverage. Does that so, help answer your question? Yeah, that's actually really helpful. And it made me think of many conversations I've had with Lucas Richmond. Um, we have this project, The Warming Sea, where we commissioned him to write about climate change in the Gulf of Maine. And I took him all over the coast um, to meet with all sorts of people. It was, it's been an amazing project. But one of the things that has come out of our conversations is that he thinks scientists stink <laughs> at t- saying what they've been successful with and, and maybe stink. Like we're just, we're not. And I was trying to explain to him once, you know, like at least from my perspective, the mode of scientists is there's a problem. We're going to figure it out. We're going to solve it or answer it. And then we're going to go on to the next problem. So we don't, we're not going to like that problem has been solved. We don't need to talk about it, which totally makes sense from the science point of view, but it really hurts from the perspective of explaining things like the ozone layer and the recovery of the ozone layer. Like we should be talking about that. And by we, I'm not really sure who I mean, (laughs) except I now put myself in the category of a science advocate of like, this is a science success story, right? Vaccines from the get-go are a science success story. And that doesn't, that was before COVID. And there's there's so many things that we don't continue to talk about. And I'm- Acid rain. It, oh, acid rain is, is a perfect example, right? I grew up outside of the Adirondacks and it, it felt like weekly there was an, a story about acid rain. And and then it's just not, we don't talk about it anymore, right? Why don't we talk about it anymore? Well, c- because we fixed it for lack of a better. How much does that weigh on you and what, what can we do about that? Um, so we, so who, what can we do about that? So I think scientists can, what they can do about it is not just move on to the next shiny thing or the next intriguing question. Right. And, and understand that given what they're studying, if it's something like impacts of climate change, pollution, there's an obligation there. Like you're obligated to follow up on, on the impact of your research. And I chased impacts when I was at Maine Sea Grant, I chased impacts. We were looking at 30, trying to understand what research 30 years ago and there, the impacts are there, but it takes work to compile that story takes work and it takes effort. Um, so that's something that scientists can do is, is follow up and find out like it hasn't, you know, that link work with organizations. So I think Both Maine Sea Grant and Scudic Institute are boundary organizations that kind of work between scientists and managers or practitioners between sort of science and and more public audiences. And so scientists can work with, you know, they don't want to do it themselves. There's plenty of partners who can help them sort of convey. I think community science is a huge movement um, where scientists can work with communities and instead of thinking they know what the problem is and posing some solution in a peer reviewed journal article, they can meet with a community to figure out what is the actual problem and and how can it, how can it help? And I think in, within the journalism world, there's a huge movement for solutions journalism. And so this is reporting on what those solutions are and, you know, what science is finding as well as what communities are doing to solve their problems. Um, So I'm just, I'm working on a story now as an example Um, We had uh, a big rainstorm last June that washed out the road in Birch Harbor, that washed out carriage roads um, and trails in Acadia National Park. And the park is still like trying to figure out what to do about the damage and what to do about trails that were basically obliterated. And I'm I'm working on a story now that talks about the damage, but I didn't want to emphasize the damage too much because it's really a story about what the park is doing about it and coming together for a couple of days with people from all the different departments sort of in the park, trails crew, the historians, the environmental compliance people, the natural, you know, the biologists and natural resources and cultural resources to come together to come up with a solution. And I think that process um, and sort of reporting on what people are doing about it not just what what the bad news is. Do you have stories that you would like to go back to, you know, if if you didn't have to sleep 
and eat and write other stories. Um, do you have stories that you would like to circle back to and kind of say, this is where we are now? Oh, probably all of them. Yeah. I realized as soon as I said that, what a ridiculous <laughs> question that was. I think there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of stories that I probably wrote 15 years ago where things have changed and we have a lot more data. So we have a lot more long, you know, long-term monitoring is so important. And as somebody who came of professional age in the 1990s and early 2000s, which was like the peak of funding for environmental monitoring, the peak of funding for, for watershed science and, you know, stream gauges have been shut down. Monitoring has just stopped. If you read the latest, the technical report from the Maine Climate Council, and you look at how many sections of that report talk about long-term monitoring that doesn't happen anymore. It's, it's pretty um, disheartening, but there's enough data that I could probably go back to a lot of those stories and, and fill in and answer some of the questions. I think my book, A Coastal Companion, so that's an almanac and there's an entry for every day of the year with seasonal phenomena like animal migration and plants, you know, blooming, flowers blooming and things happening, happening by the seasons that is wrong. So probably the dates that I put a specific topic in that book needs to be updated and everything maybe needs to be shifted a week or something. Um, so that's, you know, something I hope to do in the future. Another story that I'm hoping to revisit, which will be in 2025, will be 20 years since I paddled the Penobscot River before the dams came out. Um, and I did a whole multi-part series for Northern Sky News, a newspaper that's no longer in print, sort of just documenting what the river was like when the dams were still there. And so I'm hoping to repeat that canoe trip in a few years and, and kind of revisit a lot of the photos that I took in the notes that I had at that time. That is going to be really cool because I would imagine it will be vastly different. Not all the dams are out, right? So the two lowermost dams, so the dams yeah. to the sea. And then the third dam on the mouth of the Piscataquis River in Howland, there's a sort of a nature-like bypass channel um, around that dam, which is actually a really awesome spot. They're still making improvements to the public park, but you can, the public, you know, you can go down and look at that channel and fish are using it to migrate it. And it's, it's a really awesome thing to look at. Nice feat for an engineer. It's a very nice feat of engineering too, so. And that's really great. You know, that's that science success story and, and engineering success story of stuff that we've done. Do you have any projects at Scudic that surprised you with how much you learned that you didn't know before? I'm just thinking you went from a, a pretty long time doing water and uh, between Mitchell Center and Sea Grant, but then you get to do and uh, jump into birds and um, forests. So I'm wondering if you, there's any with those that you found just super cool that you got to dive into. For us, absolutely learning about trees. I mean, I never, I didn't take forest ecology and, um, but I think, you know, trees in the woods were sort of my first kind of an environment. Well, the beach anyway, they're all, they're all there originally, but, but getting to really get into the forest and learn, especially about how the complexity and diversity in, you know, quote unquote, old growth forests um, and understand like how a forest works, everything from how to know if, an old, if, if a forest is old and sort of how to be able to assess a forest just by sort of looking in it is something that I learned from going into the forest with forest ecologists, as well as sort of how trees grow and sort of the threats to them you know, everything from seedling, you know, we study all phases of the forest. So everything from like, which seeds are going to germinate in a warming world to, you know, which trees from the South are going to grow better. How are the Northern trees going to survive and how sort of they all work together. And so I think learning about forest ecology and now it's also, I'm writing um, as a freelancer about forests for Northern Woodlands magazine. And so getting to sort of continue that focusing on the forest. But the most exciting thing is the nexus between forests and oceans. So the coastal forest specifically um, has a lot of unique features. Do you have any authors or books that you think have done a really good job in communicating science in a way that's unusual or innovative? Um, and I'm not entirely sure, you know, like 
one of my one of my default authors. I just my favorite author, I think, is Barbara Kingsolver, who always has this extraordinary thread. Not always in almost every one of her books is a thread of science. Um, you know, and if you know her background, you know she's a uh, microbiologist, and it, she just and she's just a stunning writer, just absolutely stunning. Um, so I'm just curious, as someone who's in the field, if you have a couple of recommendations. Well, Rachel Carson would be uh, my initial, especially her early books about the ocean. So the books before Silent Spring, um, Edge of the Sea is my favorite because it's um, a lot of it's set in Maine and the Maine coast. And honestly, if you if you think you read, you know, if you haven't read Rachel Carson or you read Silent Spring in college or something like I highly recommend that you read the ocean books, because even I continue to be impressed and surprised when I when I go back and read them. Um, I actually I'm working on a story now and I had to go pull the edge of the sea off my shelf because I always have to see what Rachel Carson wrote about something before I write about it. I think David Quammen, I mean, he's more of a straightforward science writer, but for someone who is writing about scientists and researchers. um, So his I think his latest book is The Tangled Tree about evolution of life. So so he's a good one. I also John McPhee, sort of another one of my um, default writers. And then. You know, I don't know if you'd consider her a science writer, but Rebecca Solnit's writing that sort of merges history and sort of contemporary issues and personal reflection um, when she does sort of write about science. um, It's definitely for me sort of something that I aspire to as a writer. I think my definition of science is pretty broad, so I will take that. (laughs) Catherine, this has been great. I really appreciate this. I've been a big admirer of your work for a really long time. So it's Thank been you. really fun to talk to you and get a little bit of your backstory. Your whole face lights up when you talk about the work you, that you get to do in the writing. And I, I kind of joked about not sleeping, but I really am not sure how you how you get as much done as you do. So I, I, don't, really have a lot of, I don't have a lot of free time. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate you giving me a sliver of your time for this. I really do. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Maine Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios, Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. It is produced and edited by me, Kate Dickerson. I receive production support from Miranda Bouchard and social media support from Next Media. The Discover Main theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.